you good morning everyone morning. you're very welcome to stand this morning to see we have some visitors with us and i'd like to invite you to join us afterwards for a cup of tea or coffee out in the coffee area um, I have been handed a couple of announcements. Um, the coffee morning yesterday for Ellie was a great success. 560 pounds, 45 was raised, and I'd like to thank everybody for their support coming along and helping out. That's great, great amount. Um, another reminder, uh, the session meeting will be on Tuesday at 7.45, not Monday, so session on Tuesday. Um, the evening service this evening will be out in the coffee area. Um, it's a new style of service. So, um, Our first hymn this morning is There is a Redeemer. Thank you, my Father, for giving us your Son. Let's all stand and sing. <coughs> I just want to say, if you hear any giggling down in the front row, it'll be Danny, because apparently my glasses totally amuse him. So. <laughs> um, I was at an event recently up at Stormont celebrating the International Women's Day, and I was reminded about Helen Keller Rice. We're probably all familiar with at least some of her work. She was ahead of her time in many ways. Born in 1900, she became an advertising manager, which was quite rare for women in those days. And she went on to campaign for women's rights and improving working conditions. She also had a gift for inspirational writing, and that's probably what she's most famous for. I came across one of her poems or prayers recently, and I would like us to pray this this morning. Let us pray. God, give us eyes to see the beauty of the spring, and to behold your majesty in every living thing. And may we see in lacy leaves and every budding flower the hand that rules the universe with gentleness and power. And may this Easter grandeur that spring lavishly imparts awaken faded flowers of faith lying dormant in our hearts. And give us ears to hear, dear Lord, the springtime song of flowers with messages more meaningful than man's often empty words, telling harried human beings who are lost in dark despair. Be like us, and do not worry, for God has you in his care. Amen. Boys and girls, it's time for you to go out to crash in Sunday school.
And Don has something exciting in store today. <laughs> Our second phrase this morning is, Lord, I lift your name on high. Let us stand and sing. from John chapter 7 verses 45 to 52. Finally the temple guards went back to the chief priests and Pharisees who asked them, why didn't you bring him in? No one ever spoke the way this man does, the guards declared. You mean he has deceived you also, the Pharisees retorted. Has any of the rulers or the Pharisees believed in him? No, but this mob that knows nothing of the law, there is a curse on them. Nicodemus, who had gone to Jesus earlier and who was one of their own number, asked, Does our law condemn a man without first hearing him to find out what he's doing? They replied, Are you from Galilee too? Look into it and you will find that a prophet does not come out of Galilee. Amen. Let us pray. We thank you, Lord, that you promise to be with us always. Thank you, your presence is here with us right now. We know that you specialise in finding and changing people we consider out of reach. It took a while for Nicodemus to come out of the dark, but God was patient with this undercover believer. Today we give you our heart, our minds and our lives. Heavenly Father, still our hearts and minds this morning as we've come before you. Help us remember that you have a plan for each and every one of us. We may have pieces of the jigsaw, but you have the picture. Help us to be patient and trust you. Calm our wayward minds and listen to your voice. Lord, we pray that you would deepen our comprehension, broaden our thinking and transform our understanding of what we're about to hear from Danny. You are our wise counsellor, perfect teacher and our faithful friend. We thank you, Lord. Amen. We're now going to sing As the Deer Pants. Stand and sing. Yeah. 
So I've come to the end of, of this very long chapter, chapter 7. Uh, it's the Feast of the Tabernacles. We've been looking at it now for a wee while, only because we had a break for, for Easter. Uh, and we're at the very end of, of this chapter. We know that during this chapter, Jesus has been speaking, and, and many people are impressed by what he's saying. But, but the Pharisees and the scribes, they're really annoyed with what he's, he's saying and, and, and try to think of ways in which they can, they can get rid of him. And so they decide eventually, right, this is it. We're going to arrest him. We're going to bring him on, get him arrested, get him away from everybody, and, and sort him who wants him for all. So they send uh, the temple priests or the temple police uh, to arrest Jesus. Uh, and so the guards come back and they haven't got Jesus. And, and they say, well, well, well where is he? Well, well, why have you not arrested him? And then they made this statement. We haven't heard anybody speak like this man. And I first thought, thought for a moment or two this morning, I want to look at the three reactions uh, to the life of Christ that we see in this passage. And I actually think there are three reactions that we get nowadays. Uh, to who Jesus is. When people say who Jesus is, then they'll say one of these three things. You've got the reaction of, of the guards themselves. You've got the reaction of Nicodemus, who, who remember he, though he went to speak with Jesus in, in chapter 3. And he speaks in this passage. And then you've got the reaction of the Pharisees and, 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 and what they thought of Jesus. And I think we find those three reactions uh, when you talk about Jesus today to folk. So let's look, first of all, at the reaction of uh, the guards. These are men who are, are doing their job. That, that's what they're supposed to do. Uh, you wonder why they have guards uh, in, the, in the temple. But the temple's a wee bit different from a church. Sometimes people think the temple's just like the church. But it's not really. It, it, it was far bigger than, than an ordinary church because you had the building... And then you had these areas. You had the areas for, for Jewish men, uh, which was a big, big area. And then you had an area for, for Jewish women. And then you had a big area for, for the Gentiles. Uh, and so you had to have guards to make sure that the Jewish women didn't go in where the Jewish men should be. Or Gentiles don't go wherever the, the, the men, the Jewish men should be. And so the guards have to make sure that the people stayed where they should be. It's a wee bit like going along to another island football match. Uh, you get a ticket, and on the ticket it will say gate 3, door F, seat 14. Uh, and there's people about there, there's guards at every stage, so there's guards at the gates uh, to make sure that you go to the right gate. Uh, there's guards, and I think that's what you do, isn't it? Yeah. See, those guards are lovely people. <laughs> I'll say no more than that. And then, and then you've got guards at the doors to make sure you go in the right door. And then you've got guards, but they're not really guards, they're called guides or something. I'm not sure what you're called. Security. Security. I knew it was a, that's not what they're called, but that's what they call themselves. And, uh, and you've got security then that will take you to your seat uh, and whatever your seat is. And, uh, and you have to show your ticket at each stage. Well, that's what these guards were about, if you like. They, they made sure that people went through the right gate. Uh, and they went through the right door. And while they were there, they behaved themselves. Uh, they didn't take any drinking, or they didn't take anything that they shouldn't have. And if they misbehaved, then these guards took them out. That, that, was, the, that was the purpose of the guard. So I think that's a, that's a good example we can see today in a, 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 a modern football match. You have security to make sure that everybody goes to the right place at the right time. And while they're there, they, they behave in the right manner. And if they didn't, then they were, they were taken, they were arrested and taken out. And so the Pharisees who were in charge of these guards said, listen, go and arrest them. We've had enough. And so these, these guys are, are professionals. They've done it before. They know how to do it. Uh, they know their responsibility. They know how to go and take somebody and bring them out. They, they do it all the time, particularly during these festivals. Uh, there's big, big crowds at the festivals. And, and so therefore they know how to do this well. But when they go to take Jesus, this is the first reaction we notice. These are people who are doing their job. People that, that, who, who don't know anything about Jesus. So they, they haven't got any background about this man. All they've been told is to go and arrest him. So they have no thoughts about this person. All they need to know is that this is the person they have to go and arrest and bring back. 
But when they go and they hear him speak, they don't arrest him. They don't arrest him. Isn't that amazing? They don't arrest him. In fact, when they come back, they make a statement that is absolutely amazing. They said, we didn't arrest him because he speaks like no one we have ever heard speak like before. This guy is different. And for a moment or two then, what do you think Jesus was saying? Of course, when Jesus spoke, he spoke with conviction. But that's not what it would have been. Because lots of us speak with conviction. You can speak with conviction and be wrong. Look at Boris Johnson with the big bus. 365 million a week. That will be spent on our National Health Service. Vote no, vote leave, get out, he said. And he was full of conviction. And we all thought, we Boris knows what he's talking about. And now that we're leaving, the 365 million on the bus has disappeared. And that was spoken with great conviction. But he didn't know what he was talking about. You know, so we can speak with conviction, but be wrong, you know. Because there was folk who were speaking with conviction to say, we should leave Europe. And there was folk who were speaking with conviction and said, we should stay in Europe. And both were really convinced that what they were saying was right. And they were convinced this was the best for the country. And so it wasn't so much that he spoke with conviction, although he would have done. That's not what made him different, because lots of people speak with conviction. It's not that that he spoke powerfully, because some people do speak powerfully. I remember when I first came out, I was going out with Lorraine, and I came over to visit. It would have been the summer of 81, the summer of 81. And, and there was a big protest, and Mr. Paisley was taking a crowd of people up the Newton Arts Road to go up to Stormont to protest about something. I have no idea what it was, and um, probably you don't remember what it was either. But Lorraine said to me, come on, we'll see the protest. Lorraine must have been involved in protests a lot, because she said, come on, we'll see the protest. And I said, hey, that's all right. I, I'll go, I can see a protest like anybody else can see a protest. And there was Mr. Paisley walking down the road, and I must say, I almost felt like joining him because there was a bit of presence about the man. It was big and powerful, and he waved to everybody, you know, oh, you see the way he went. I thought, you could see how folk could follow a man like that. He was a man of presence, he was. And I know that later on in his life, eh, when he got ill, he, he changed. And the very last time I saw him, I was watching another parade, and it was up in the North Road, and he came out, and he was standing there with his hat on. And it was almost like the heart was too big for him. The heart was almost covering his whole body. You know, he, he was a frail old man. And I remember thinking, what a change from the first time I saw him. He was big and powerful, and, and he spoke with conviction, but he also spoke with power, you know. When I speak, you listen, you know. And, uh, and a lot of folk did listen, and a lot of folk went to prison because they listened, but that's another story. But he spoke with power. And I'm sure Jesus spoke with power. But that's not what it was either. Because lots of folk have, have spoken with great conviction. And I'm sure these guards who have been to the temple many, many times and they heard lots and lots of speakers heard folk speak with conviction uh, and speak with great skill and power. So it wasn't that. I'm convinced that what they noticed about Jesus but he spoke with great authority. And, and what he said rang true. It rang true. It was something that when, when they heard him speak, it was something that touched their hearts. They thought, there's something about this man that makes him different. And of course, we know that what it is, is because he's God himself. And when God speaks into our hearts, we know when God speaks into our hearts, when he speaks with his authority into our hearts, then we know it's God speaking. And so therefore, when Jesus spoke, he spoke with great authority. And of course, John tells us that in in the very first verse of, of chapter one. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and the Word became flesh. And so Jesus is God himself. And when he spoke, there was just something about it 
they spoke of great authority and truth. And so here people who are totally independent, they, they, they didn't have a grudge against Jesus, but they also weren't followers of Jesus. They were only men, ordinary men, doing their job. But when they heard Jesus speak, they realized that there was something different about this man. Now that didn't mean that they trusted him as Lord and Savior. No, it didn't mean that. But it meant that somebody who listens just independently or, or without a grudge or without being a follower will notice that there's something about Jesus. And I'm convinced today that if people were to hear what Jesus is to say, if they were to listen to, to the life of Jesus, if they were to read the Gospels uh, and, and, and consider who Jesus is, if they were to give him half a chance, I'm convinced every single person would say, there's something about Jesus that is different. And that doesn't mean that they'll actually come to become Christians. But I'm absolutely convinced if anybody gives them a fair hearing, that they'll recognize there's something special about Jesus. Something that they can, they can recognize that he's different from anyone else. It used to be in the 70s, we, we, we made great ideas of, of to convince people that Jesus actually existed. Uh, but lots of people said that Jesus was a myth. And we used to say things like, well, do you believe that Winston Churchill was alive? And, and folk would say, of course. And you say, well, why would you believe Winston Churchill was alive? And, and folk would say, well, well, we saw him on television. Or, or, or we, 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 we can talk to people who talk to him. And therefore, we, we want to believe that Winston Churchill was alive. And he actually existed. Because we can see him on television. And we all have a picture of what Winston Churchill looks like. A big heavy man with a cigar. I don't think he always looked like that, but that's the pictures that we all have because it's of his later life that we remember seeing Winston Churchill on television. And then someone would say, well, do you know if King Billy existed? And people say, of course King Billy existed. And, and they'd be able to tell you stories of, of why King Billy existed. And, and what did he look like? Well, he says, all you have to do is go at Gable End in Sydenham, and, and you'd see what King Billy looked like. He had a big horse and, and big flowing hair, and uh, he was about seven feet five, and he played a flute. No, not with somebody else. And, uh, but big, tall man who, you know, that, that's, that's what he's like. And actually, you can, you can argue, yes, King Billy existed, and, and it's because we, we've never seen him on television, and there's nobody that we can talk to that actually saw him. But there's lots of documents that we trust that tell us that King Billy existed. Apparently he actually was quite a small man and, and he didn't play a flute. And, and so there's other things that we find out about King Billy. But, but none of us would say in, the, in here that King Billy didn't exist because there's enough evidence. But what about Jesus? Well, actually there's more external evidence that Jesus existed than King Billy existed. We can read more external evidence not only from believers, but from unbelievers, that Jesus existed than King Billy. So if we would not doubt King Billy, it would be ridiculous for us to doubt Jesus. And so in the 70s, that's how we spoke with people. We tried to show them that Jesus actually existed. Nowadays, people don't care. People are happy enough to say that he existed. And uh, because he's not relevant, that's how people see him today. And so what we really need to be saying to people today is, Give them a gospel, whether it's Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and say, look, have a read at that. Read at it. Don't forget about all that you were taught in Sunday school. Forget about any experience you've had of church. What I want you to do, forget what other people say about Jesus. You have a read at that and give them a gospel and then say to them, you read that and then we'll chat about it again. And I'm convinced that if someone sits and reads it, then what they'll say is, there's something about Jesus that's different. And that's all they might say, but that's a start. And certainly for these guards, that's what they said. There's a second group of people, or a second person, and that's Nicodemus. Nicodemus is mentioned in this story. And he has a different response to Jesus from the guards. Nicodemus' response is, I've met with him, I've talked with him, and definitely there's something different about them. The guards were saying that he didn't speak like anybody we ever knew. But Nicodemus is going further than that. Nicodemus is actually saying, no, no, he is from God. 
He is a prophet. There's things that he says that are definitely worth arguing over and thinking over and considering. And so Nicodemus is at the next stage of, of considering what Jesus is saying and, and, and pondering it over to, to see how that is relevant to his life. We know that because he was willing to speak out whenever the Pharisees are saying that we'll need it, we'll need to get him. Uh, he said, no, 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 wait, wait a minute here. Would it not be a good idea for us to talk with Jesus? Would it not be a good idea for us to find out what, what he says and look at the things that he's done before we condemn him? And, and so he is at the stage where he's now considering and thinking. And tradition tells us actually that he comes to faith in Christ. And I'm convinced that there's people, and we know that is the case, that there's, there's people who have moved beyond the stage of the guards but at the stage of Nicodemus. That when we share with them and, and, and they've and they've read the Gospels, or they consider who he is, they begin to see how that impacts their life. They're beginning to consider what that means for them. Because if Jesus is different, if Jesus is saying things that, that no one else says, then that's worth considering what that means for us. It would be foolish of us not to. And so Nicodemus has to take the next logical step which is to consider that what Jesus is saying and who he is, how does that relate to me? And, and hopefully that's what we have done in our lives, that we've considered that and we've realized, well, actually, the only logical thing to do for men is to trust Jesus as our Lord and Savior. Once we consider who he is, once we consider what that means for us, the next logical step is for us to trust him as our Lord and Savior. That's, that's the logic of it, you know, sort of, uh, the, the, there is no other logic to it. Once we consider and come to the conclusion, honestly, that Jesus is, is different from anybody else, and it's because of the authority that he speaks with, it's because of the things that he says, they're true. Because remember when Jesus says, we'll see it later on in John 14, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Then, then what does that mean for me? If Jesus says that he's the resurrection and the life, if Jesus says that he's come to save us from our sins, if Jesus says that if we commit our life to him, that he will forgive our sins and he will give his life, life in all his fullness, what does that mean for me? That's, that's where Nicodemus is at. And, and he's willing to say to others, listen, no, no, we need to give him a fair hearing. And that's what we pray that our folk in our community, will it be the stage of the guards and the stage of Nicodemus. That's, that's what we work at as a church. But there's a third group of people here. And that's the Pharisees. The Pharisees, people who think they know it. The people who think they know God's will. The people who have studied God's word. They don't give Jesus a chance. They come with their bigoted view of Jesus. And therefore, no matter who speaks, no, no matter what is said, they will reject him. They have decided that before they hear any evidence, before they, they, they listen to, to anybody else, that Jesus is not the one to accept. Jesus is to be destroyed, he's to be arrested, he's to be put to death, and he's to be forgotten about. And we live in a society where there's people like that, that no matter what you say to them, they will reject Jesus. No matter what you say to them, they'll reject you if you trust in Jesus. No matter what you say to them, they will not listen to the evidence. In fact, what they tend to do is they tend to twist the evidence or they tend to believe half the evidence and, and, and therefore not listen to, to the full evidence. And that would be foolish, but that's what people are like. That's what the Pharisees are like. And so whenever, whenever Nicodemus says, wait a minute here, wouldn't it be sensible? And normally they would have all said yes, because that's what a court of law is about. That's what the, the Pharisees were about, is listen to the evidence and make a judgment. They did that with everybody, everybody. They listened to the evidence and then they, they, they made a judgment. But they didn't do it with Jesus. And so Nicodemus says to them, wait a minute, wouldn't it be better for us to listen to the evidence? Wouldn't it be better to talk with this man, find out what the deal is, 
And then we make a judgment. No, no, no. And then what they do quickly is they say to Nicodemus, are you from Galilee? Are you from Galilee? In other words, they begin to twist it to say, what are you saying? That they're trying to, to, to say to Nicodemus, are you one of them? And, and, and so therefore they dismiss him right away. without. And they, this is someone who's been with him for many, many years. And they quickly twist it to say, are you from Galilee? We have no idea whether he's from Galilee or not. He's probably not. But, but they, they, they quickly twist it and say, are you from Galilee? And then he says, if you know anything about the Bible, you know that no prophet can come from Galilee. Galilee was the place that just wasn't great. It was the place where nothing good can come of. It was, it was the place that... It, it, was, it was the northern kingdom. And, and, and the northern kingdom wasn't as good as the southern kingdom. It's actually a wee bit like Italy. I, I don't know if you know much about the history of Italy. But if the Italians had their way, they would get rid of South Italy. The southern part of Italy, they would get rid of tomorrow. And the reason we get rid of it tomorrow was, is because they're wasters, uh, the ground's not great, uh, there's not much happening in it, they're not good workers, they would get rid of them tomorrow. That's what the northern part of Italy would say. The only reason they don't get rid of the southern part of Italy is because, unfortunately, that's where Rome is. And Rome is the capital city. And, and lots of things happen in Rome, and Rome is so important that really they can. But where the money is made in Italy is the northern part of Italy. And therefore the northern Italians think that they're far, far superior to their poor cousins in the south. And, and Italy is really a divided country. Uh, and there's a bit of an attitude uh, about that. It was true in Scotland. Uh, we, we call people who are English Sassanax. Uh, Sassanax's not a good word. Uh, and, uh, but actually, the original Sassanax were not, Scot were, were not English. The original Sassanax were those who lived in Glasgow and Edinburgh. You know, that, that, that low land period. And, and the word was used by the Highlanders. And if you were from, uh, from Glasgow or, or Edinburgh along that border area, along that, that, that worth area, then you were known as the Sassanacs, the lowlanders, the, 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 the folk who don't really know how to fight, those who don't really know how to act properly as the Scottish. And, uh, you know, because whenever the, the, the Romans came, the Romans came and conquered the southern part of Scotland and came up as far as, as Glasgow and Edinburgh. But they didn't come up to the Highlands. The Picts, they stopped, they stopped the Romans. We are the proper Scottish. And the Sassanacs were those who lived in the southern uplands uh, and in the central lowlands. And uh, so whereas we now use it to mean the English, and, and, and originally it wasn't the case. And we can sometimes have that attitude, you know, sort of, Northern Ireland, we're hard workers, the Southern Irish, well, they don't really know how to work, you know. They got a lot of handouts from, from Europe, and that's where they get their money, and, 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 uh, and they're really not really workers at all. But we folk from the North, we know how to work. We are workers, you know. That's where the industry was, the industry was, in, it was in the northern part of Ireland. You know, and, and, and every place has that. Uh, I was talking to my friend Brian Simons, who, who lives in, uh, um, who used to live uh, uh, down in, in Bloomfield. And he said that there was one side of the road that was the rough side. And then there was the posh side of the road. Where we lived in Glasgow, uh, there's a really rough estate called Drum Chapel. And, and that's where I'm from. And so people would say in, in Glasgow, where are you from, Jim Chapel? Can anything good come out of Jim Chapel? But then it gets worse. Because within Jim Chapel, in an estate of about 60,000 people, that's one housing estate. And within that one estate of 60,000 people, there was the place called Up the Hill. Now, Up the Hill, they eat themselves. You know, they really do. And, uh, and of course, that's where we were from, Up the Hill. And therefore, if, if, if folks said that you're from Jim Chapel, where about from Jim Chapel? You say, I'm, I'm from up the hill. Oh, you're up, have a seat, sir. You know, and uh, it was really rough. 
Well, that's what it was like. And so what, what the Pharisees are saying is, can any prophet, can any prophet come from Galilee? You should know the answer is no. And of course, we're reading this and we're thinking, those Pharisees are nutters. Because they should understand that Jesus was born in Bethlehem. And, and he's only living in Nazareth. Although his mom and dad were from Nazareth, Jesus himself was born in Bethlehem. And of course, they don't know that story. And the reason they don't know that story is because they're not interested in the story. Because the, the narrative that they have is Jesus is from Nazareth and nothing good can come out of Nazareth. It's the up the hill part of Galilee. Are you from Nazareth? Oh my goodness. Only the scum of the earth come from Nazareth. So a prophet who is a wonderful man from Nazareth? No, that, that's not the case. And it's not that they don't understand. They choose not to find out the truth. And we have people like that today. We have people who will never give Christianity a chance. We have people who will never give Jesus a chance. They will always have an answer at the tip of their tongue to say something bad about Jesus. We'll say why they can't believe. Because of this or that or the next thing. Because they're not willing to consider the truth. They're not willing to consider Jesus. And that means I said they'll reject you and me. As they rejected Nicodemus. They turned on him quickly. And, and they accused him of something that might not have been true. But that's what they do. Whenever they don't want to consider Jesus. So why are we looking at this this morning? Because we can go away discouraged. Because we can think, well there's three groups. And actually there's only two groups and an individual. And of all those three groups, there's only one of them. And that's only that one individual who's actually given Jesus a chance and who actually then comes and trusts Jesus uh, later on. There's a group of people who, who give Jesus a chance and who listens to him and who come to the conclusion there's definitely something different about him. There's the other group who, who don't listen at all and, and who will twist anything to make Jesus sound bad. They will not give him a chance and therefore they will not give anybody a chance who believes in Jesus, what should we do? Well, the great thing is, the Bible tells us that there's always going to be three groups of people. And that means for us as a church, there's always going to be people living in Sydney and living in Belfast and living in Northern Ireland who are like Nicodemus, who didn't know anything about him, but who hear about him. And the more they hear, the more they believe. And the more they believe, the more they apply it to themselves. And the more they apply it to themselves, then they come and they trust Jesus as their Lord and Saviour. And so there's many people in Sydney who are going to be like Nicodemus. And our role is not to allow the guards to put us off, and certainly not to allow the Pharisees to put us off, but to continue to be faithful so that those who are in the group like Nicodemus will come and find him. And so Jesus didn't play to the guards, and he didn't play to the Pharisees, but he continued to be who he was, recognizing that some people will like him, some people will hate him, but others will follow him. And therefore, as a church, our responsibility is to not change like the crowds and our change to try and please people, but our responsibility is to continue to live like Jesus. And as we continue to live like Jesus, then many people will come and follow him, just like Nicodemus. Let's pray together. Father, we come before you, and we thank you that you were constant while you were here in this earth. Constant in the way that you thought, constant in the way that you spoke, and constant in the way that you lived. And that meant that there was various types of of reaction to you. There were some people who heard you and were amazed. There was other people who heard you and accepted you and followed you. But there were others who didn't want to hear you and constantly misunderstood you deliberately because they were against you. 
And no matter what you said, no matter what you did, they were going to be against you. Sometimes, Lord, we are shocked when people are against you nowadays. Help us to recognize that because we are your followers, some people will accept what we say, other people will consider what we're saying, and will follow you maybe because of some of the things that we say. But there will always be people who will reject us because they reject you. Remind us to be faithful as you were faithful. For we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Part of our worship this morning is we have an opportunity to take up this morning's offering. Lovely hymn at the end. Is that a traditional hymn? But it's a hymn that we know really well. And it's what a friend we have in Jesus. Let's stand as we worship. Now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit rest and remain with each one of us now and for always. Amen. Amen.